Welcome to what is now the fourth lecture in this series on the critique of pure reason. Today we get to the most important part of the critique, that part of the transcendental logic called the transcendental analytic, and most particularly we get to the first part of that, the analytic of concepts. Before I start, you'll notice by the way that behind me are some boards courtesy of Staples. We'll have a little show and tell today later on. But before I start with the text, I would like to respond to a comment posted by a blog reader of mine. I run a blog appropriately called The Philosopher's Stone, a title that was then stolen by a not very good column in the New York Times. And one of my readers posted the following comment. I won't try to reproduce the, the, the web name. People on the web have the weirdest names. They, names that make it impossible to tell whether the person is male or female, old or young, in this country or some other country, or even real. But at any rate, this blog reader said, you don't make Kant sound very careful about the way he uses terms. Sort of surprising, given that you also said unequivocally that the critique is the greatest work of philosophy ever written. I thought I ought to respond to that, since the, the reader was quite correct. I'm rather cavalier about a good deal of what's in the critique. And given that I think that it's the greatest work of philosophy ever written, you would think that sheer piety would lead me to be somewhat less dismissive of so much of what Kant writes. The great philosophers, especially the great old philosophers, were system builders, many of them. And a good deal of what they did and a good deal of what they thought was important was to elaborate a systematic structure that encompassed all of human experience and divine experience as well, if they were that kind of philosopher. You think, for example, of the Summa Theologica of St. Thomas Aquinas, or even a book like Hobbes's Leviathan, which covers so much in one volume and finds a place for everything, or the Treatise of Human Nature, which is not only a book in which in the first in, in book one of the treatise, there are very powerful critical arguments about causation. But there are things about psychology and morality and politics and so forth. And Kant is, of course, one of those systematizers. Now, it's wonderful to see a philosopher do this and to see with what imagination and uh, what elaboration he or she can spell out a whole system in a book. And some people who study those books spend a lot of time trying to get clear what the system is and sorting it all out and getting all the terms. As Gilbert and Sullivan say, or I guess it was Gilbert, learn up the, terms of the, uh, learn up the germs of the transcendental terms, as he says in Patience. But some people, like myself, are looking for powerful arguments, not picky arguments, Arguments that may lie below the surface and that may require a good deal of excavation, but still arguments that, that can support a powerful and important thesis. And in pursuit of those arguments, uh, people like myself and many others tend to brush past the elaborate architectonic structure of the book, looking for the parts of it where the argument really is developed and can be laid out in some systematic form. And that's what I'm doing in these lectures. That's not the only way to read a great work of philosophy, of course. And there are distinguished Kant commentators who know a great deal about, more about Kant than I ever will, and furthermore, e read German easily, which I don't, alas, a source of some embarrassment, but at my age I can finally confess my sins. But who seem more interested in elaborating the system than in actually sustaining and finding the arguments. So that's what I'm doing. Now you see these boards here. There are actually two of them. There's one behind this one. And if you, with a little imagination, you can probably guess that the other one has the, the table of categories on it, which we will get to today. Later on, two or three or four lectures from now, I'm not sure how many, when I reach the point at which I can lay out the entire argument the proof for the causal maxim that I promised you in my first lecture. I've actually had Staples make up seven boards with an argument in great big letters so everybody will be able to read it even if they're reading it from Russia or India. 
And I will go through those boards one at a time and take you through the argument. I'm not saying it'll convince you, but I will show you that it really is a coherent argument that has some command on our respect. At any rate, that's why I am rather, uh, why I make Kant sound not very careful about the way he used terms. Kant was, in fact, not very careful about the way he used some terms, most notably the one which I've already talked about, transcendent and transcendental which is enough to drive you crazy until you realize what's going on. But there are lots of other examples as well. So partly he just forgets, partly he's got so much going on that he doesn't really bother about it. But it's not in the end important. What is important is the argument. So, let's start. And I will start with the opening passage from the transcendental logic, this is the very beginning of what we had to read for today. By the way, I have to say, especially for those of you watching this on YouTube, either tomorrow or the next day or six months from now or five years from now or in the year 2024, whenever, one never knows. I am assuming that you're reading the text as we go along. It's hard enough to make sense out of this when you're reading the text. If you're not reading the text, it's like watching Romeo and Juliet in Pashtu. I mean, it may be fun, but you won't have the foggiest idea what's going on, unless you know Pashtu, of course, but that's neither here nor there. Here we go. Kant starts, our knowledge springs from two fundamental sources of the mind. The first is the capacity of receiving representations, receptivity for impressions, the second is the power of knowing an object through these representations, spontaneity in the production of concepts. Through the first, an object is given to us. Through the second, the object is thought in relation to that given representation, which is a mere determination of the mind. Intuition and concepts constitute, therefore, the elements of all our knowledge, so that neither concepts without intuitions in some way corresponding to them, nor intuition without concepts can yield knowledge. And that's at A51, B75, the opening paragraph of the Transcendental Logic. And then later on in the next paragraph, he writes the sentence, which is one of the most famous taglines from all of, the, all of Kant. Thoughts without content are empty. Intuitions without concepts are blind. Okay. Now, you will recall that two lectures ago, Professor Nelson asked a question which I felt I hadn't adequately answered. So I came in to the last lecture, cranked up with an answer for him. He, he had stated the question again for me. I quoted what he had said and then gave an answer. Well, his question was, as I said earlier, the gift that keeps on giving. Because I decided yet again to have a shot on the basis of this at explaining why it is that Kant thinks that we need both concepts and intuitions. And the interesting thing is, I, re I, I knew this, I just didn't call the passage up immediately at the time, that Kant really only answers the question much later in the text in a portion of the book called The Postulates of Empirical Thought, which we don't get to for quite some time. And so let's turn all the way ahead to A225-6, which is B272-3. Here is what Kant says. In the mere concept of a thing, no mark of its existence is to be found. For though it may be so complete that nothing which is required for thinking the thing with all its inner determinations is lacking to it, Yet existence has nothing to do with all this, but only with the question whether such a thing be so given us that the perception of it can, if need be, precede the concept. And then skipping a sentence or so, he goes on, we can also, however, however, know the existence of the thing prior to its perception, and consequently, comparatively speaking, in an a priori manner, if only it be bound up with certain perceptions in accordance with the principles of their empirical connection. He makes reference here to a part of the text that he's just finished writing called The Analogies. For the existence of the thing being thus bound up with our perceptions in a possible experience, we are able in the series of possible perceptions and under the guidance of the analogies to make the transition from our actual perception 
to the thing in question. Thus, from the perception of the attracted iron filings, we know of the existence of a magnetic matter pervading all bodies, although the constitution of our organs cuts us off from all immediate perception of this medium. Let me explain what Kant is saying here by an extended reference to Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. I assume that all of you know about Lord of the Rings, even if you haven't read it all. Tolkien was an extraordinary writer and also a linguist of some distinction. He not only wrote the three volumes of Lord of the Rings, which, which have been made into movies and so forth, he wrote the prequel called The Hobbit, and he wrote a prequel to that called The Silmarillion. And taking all together, they give you this elaborate story about Middle Earth, the first age of Middle Earth, the second age of Middle Earth, complete with languages that he made up. The language, for example, for the orcs and the language for the elves. I have to tell you, by the way, I do this because I think I may be one of the few people who knows about the existence of this text, which is now tragically lost and may never be found. Some of you may know the name Charles Mills, a brilliant political philosopher whose first book, The Racial Contract, is in my judgment one of the most important pieces of political philosophy of the last 50 years. When Charles was up for tenure, I was asked to serve as an external evaluator, and I was sent a bunch of material by him. I read the material, and there wasn't any question he deserved a full professorship on the spot. But one of the things included in this packet of material was a brilliant ideological critique of the Lord of the Rings from the point of view of the, of the untermenschen, of the orcs, for example. And what Mills showed brilliantly was that it was a thoroughly racially encoded uh, text in which the elves are highest. They are the northern Europeans, essentially. They are the highest. Then there are the hobbits. And at the very bottom are the orcs, who are the southern Europeans. At one point, uh, Mills remarks that although Tolkien creates the language for the orcs, he doesn't translate it for us. And so there are signs posted in Orcish at various points that our heroes encounter. And Mills imagines that some of the signs say things like, Gandalf, go home. At any rate, I, was, I, I had a copy of it, and somehow, mysteriously, I lost it. Some of you may think, sure, why not? You lose everything. But I'm a pack rat when it comes to these things. I have every paper I wrote as an undergraduate, for example. I have complete records on every student I've taught since 1954. So how this paper went, went missing, I don't know. And I wrote to Charles and said, Charles, I'm very embarrassed, but I have lost a copy of your paper, which he never published, by the way. He was afraid if he published it, there'd be problems. So can you send me another copy? And he said, no, I've lost it. So that paper, which he knows existed since he wrote it, and which I know exists because I read it, is now unavailable. And it is a brilliant paper. If anybody watching this YouTube video has a copy of that, contact me, I would, or contact Charles Mills. I would love a copy, and I think he would too. At any rate, here's the thing. Tolkien, with enormous imagination, spells out the whole history of Middle Earth. But at no point does that history connect with a present perception of somebody in our world. There is no point, there, there's, there's not a Rosetta Stone, which is carved partly in Old Greek and partly in Orcish or Elvish or whatever. There is no perception that any of us has ever had which links directly with something that indirectly can be linked by causal inference with anything in the world of Middle Earth. And therefore, we have no idea, for example, does the world of Middle Earth precede our world? Does, is it supposed to have come after our world? It's like you know the beginning of the Star Wars movies, uh, long ago and of galaxy far away. And here you are, this futuristic science fiction story. So long as you can make that connection,
Kant is telling us. So long as there is a present perception, which by causal inference you can connect with something that you can't directly perceive, then you can, it, it has reality for you. Absent that present perception, no matter how detailed the elaboration of the story, it has no reality. It is not part of our reality. It is not part of the realm of appearances. And that is why, that's a way of saying why it is that Kant thinks that one needs intuitions as well as concepts. Concepts, no matter how elaborated, can only give us a possible or hypothetical world. It is intuition that connects us to the reality of appearances the realm of appearances, the realm of phenomena, as he calls it in other places. Okay. Uh, now you'll notice, uh, by the way, that we get at A56 this definition of uh, transcendental. Not every kind of knowledge a priori should be called transcendental, but only that by which we know that and how certain representations, intuitions, or concepts can be employed or are possible purely a priori. The term transcendental, that is to say, signifies such knowledge as concerns the a priori possibility of knowledge or its a priori employment. In short, it is taken to mean something or some part of what we would call epistemology. And that, that is the way in which Kant uses, or is supposed to use, the term transcendental. He doesn't always use it that way, but it would, it would be nice if he did. And now, finally, we come to the functions of unity in judgment. This is the first step in the argument that's going to lead, eventually, to the proof for the causal maxim. And at A68 equal to B93, he says, Whereas all intuitions as sensible rest on affections, concepts rest on functions. By function, I mean the unity of the act of bringing various representations under one common representation. Since no representation, save when it is an intuition, is in immediate relation to an object, no concept is ever related to an object immediately, but to some other representation of it be that other representation an intuition or itself a concept. Judgment is therefore the immediate knowledge of an object, that is, the representation of a representation of it. And then we get the famous table of, of uh, judgments, of functions of understanding and judgments. And now I will scoot to the side and we will zoom in on my show and tell, which is the logical function of the understanding and judgment, the first of the tables in this chapter. By the way, I should say, if you wonder how this camera magically zooms in, it doesn't magically zoom in. It's being zoomed in by Alex Campbell, who is a doctoral student in the UNC Chapel Hill Philosophy Department. It is he who is responsible for taking the data off that tiny little camcorder, converting it into a form which can be uploaded to YouTube, and then uploading it. Uh, a very tedious process, I might add, and I'm very grateful to him for doing this. Now, assuming that everybody can see this, here we have this table, and Kant is enormously pleased with this table. He loves it, and it keeps cropping up in warm, one form or another throughout the critique. There are these four headings for these logical functions, quantity, quality, I assume that now all you can see is my finger, which is nice, makes it seem sort of magical. Quantity, quality, modality, and relation. Forget about relation for the moment and think only about quantity, quality, and modality. First of all, there is the quantity of judgments. Some judgments are universal, all A are B. Some judgments are particular, some A are B. And then Kant says, for epistemological or transcendental purposes, we must add the singular judgment. He adds this because otherwise the table doesn't look quite so neat. The singular judgment is a judgment which functions like a universal judgment, but which is the subject of which is not the name of an individual thing. X is B, like Socrates is mortal, as opposed to all men are mortal, 
Those are the, that's the quantity of judgments. The quality of judgments, can, they can be affirmative, negative, or infinite. Affirmative is A is B, negative is A is not B, and infinite is A is non-B. This is an old distinction going all the way back to Aristotle, if I'm not mistaken. There's a difference between saying that man is mortal and saying that man is, is, that man is not immortal and saying that man is non immortal or something of the sort. It's not an important distinction for Kant's argument, but it fleshes out the table. And finally, there's the modality. A judgment can be asserted problematically, possibly A is B, or assertorically, A is B, or apodictically, necessarily A is B. Now, if you think about it, you have three sets of three. And if you combine them, you have 3 times 3 times 3, which is 27 different judgment types. Uh, for example, you could have a universal, affirmative, problematic judgment. That would be possibly all A, R, B. Or you could have a particular negative, assertoric judgment, or apodictic judgment which is necessarily no A or B. Or you could have an assertoric singular infinite judgment, X is non-B. There are 27 different possible combinations, 3 times 3 times 3. And as I think I, as I, think I mentioned, uh, maybe even during my very first lecture, way back when I was I and my, my, college, my graduate apartment mate, Charles Parsons, were running a Kant study group in our apartment. Our friend Sam Totus got it into his head that these 27 possible judgment types corresponded to the 27 subsections of the, the, analytic, of, uh, the analytic of concepts that Kant introduced in the second edition. And we had this big uproarious argument about it. I thought that was a nutty view, and Sam, who didn't really believe it but thought it would be fun to defend it, defended it to the death. <coughs> Philosophers do that, by the way. I'll just tell you one brief story that I witnessed myself. When I was a graduate student, the Graduate Philosophy Club was, targeted, was, was tasked with the job of inviting visitors to speak. And Harvard was very strange in one respect. When a distinguished visitor came to speak, none of the members of the department would show up at the lecture. This was marvelous for the graduate students because we got to ask questions. It was a little weird for the visitor who would show up and none of the members of the department would be there for his or her talk. But Rogers Albritton showed up to give a talk which was a job talk. That is to say, he was, in, he was being interviewed for an assistant professorship. So the whole department showed up. This was, I think, the first time in a very long time that all of them had been in the same room together. And they didn't really quite know how to behave. So it was a little odd. Anyway, Albritton gave his talk, which is a very recherche talk on the third man problem in Plato. I mean, it was something that most of us knew nothing about, but all Britain was quite brilliant. And came time, I was chairing the meeting. I was the treasurer of the club that year, and I was chairing the meeting. Came question time, every member of the department raised his hand. And I panicked. I mean, you know, these were my professors. Whom do I call on first? So I retreated to tradition and called on the oldest member of the department, Raphael Dimas, and went from there. Well, John Wilde asked a question, and he got into an argument with All Britain about whether forms could participate in themselves in Plato's theory. And Wilde was saying that forms could participate in themselves. And all Britain said, well, does that mean that the form of man is a man? And Wilde, who never backed down from a position, said yes. At that, Quine, Willard Van Orman Quine woke up. That struck him as an interesting claim. And he, he said, he said, Donald, do you mean that the form of a man has arms and legs? And Wilde said, yes. And the two of them got into this uproariously funny argument, which the rest of us just collapsed in laughter at. And poor Albritton, who was there for a job interview, thought he had taken a wrong turn and had wandered not into the Harvard Philosophy Department, but into the local mental hospital. 
At the end of the hour of questions, all the members of the department summarily left, leaving me to take care, care of Albritton, who was by this point shattered. And I took him back to his hotel room, and of course he thought, well, that's it, I've blown the job opportunity. So naturally he got the job and was a brilliant member of the department. But at any rate, uh, I can't even for the life of me remember why I told you that story, but I'm sure it was for some very good reason. But it was a lot of fun. At any rate, uh, the functions of relation are completely different. They're, we haven't said anything yet about the functions of relation, and they are very important. But functions of unity, uh, of, of logical function of, of, of relation, categorical, hypothetical, and disjunctive. What's different about these, of course, is that they are, if you wish, Boolean or truth functional uh, connectives. They are not forms of a, of a, of a or dimensions of a judgment. The categorical is A is B, the hypothetical is if A is B, then C is D, and this disjunctive is A is B, or C is D, or E is F, or G is H, and so forth and so on. These will turn out to be very, very important almost immediately when I show you my second board, but they are, they are there in this table really because Kant was just enchanted with the idea of a system of four trios. What's more, shades of Hegel to come. The third is in some way the unity of the first and the second, God help us. Uh, not quite, but supposedly. And Kant was rather enchanted with that as well. It's not quite thesis, antithesis, synthesis, but it's creeping up on that. And as I say, this turns up again and again in the critique, the same table. It's sort of like Paul Samuelson's economics text. If you've ever studied economics and had used Samuelson's text, the thing about Samuelson's text is it's so brilliantly done that all the diagrams, if you overlap them on one another, perfectly overlap. So all of the supply and demand curves in one, in one diagram perfectly mesh with all the supply and demand diagrams in another, in another uh, curves in another diagram, making it very easy to follow. And in the same way, Kant loves this table of four triads, and they crop up over and over and over again. At any rate, what we don't yet know is why this emphasis on unity. That's actually a central question, but we won't find out the answer to it quite yet. I just flag it. You may have wondered, why are, why are all of these functions of unity and judgment? And that will become clear next week, but not yet this week. Now he, Kant makes the transition to the categories, or what the, their technical name, the pure concepts of understanding. And he begins by introducing what is one of the key terms in the, in the critique, the term synthesis. He says, this is right at the beginning of uh, section three, A77. He says, space and time contain a manifold of pure a priori intuition, but at the same time are conditions of the receptivity of our mind, conditions under which alone it can receive representations of objects, and which therefore must also always affect the concept of these objects. But if this manifold is to be known, the spontaneity of our, uh, spontaneity of our thought requires that it be gone through in a certain way taken up and connected. This act I name synthesis. By synthesis in its most general sense, I understand the act of putting different representations together and of grasping what is manifold in them in one act of knowledge. Now this concept of synthesis, of the unifying of a manifold, that is to say a manyness of representations in a single concept is central to the argument. But it is also, let me emphasize at this point, a metaphor. I mean, it isn't the case that the mind runs through its representations as though it were gathering daisies in the field, goes through and collects them up in its hands and holds them all together in a bouquet. That isn't what is going on. Whatever's going on, it's not that. But that's what Kant makes it sound like here. Grasping them, that, that's, that's actually the, 
I mean, the German is the root sense of grasping, it's begreifen. Grasping what is manifold in, in, manifold in them in one act of knowledge. Before we can understand the critique at all, this is, let me just say, speaking autobiographically, as though I didn't always speak autobiographically, it was at this point that I really realized I needed to get deeper into what was going on if I were ever to understand the critique. Because I couldn't understand what this act of synthesis was. I couldn't understand how it was that a manyness was gathered together into a unity, into a oneness. And just to get ahead of myself into next week's lecture, the place where we find out what this really means where Kant, as they used to say, cashes in the metaphor of synthesis is in what is called the subjective deduction, the next section after this one, which I will lecture on next week. You'll recall that at the very beginning of these lectures, I called your attention in the preface in A to a curious passage where Kant says of that passage, the subjective deduction, that it's not really important because it's just psychological, although, as I shall show, it is actually important. That's what he says. Let me, let me just go back, if I can, very quickly. I, hadn't, I haven't marked it, but if I can go back to the preface in the first edition and very quickly mark it. He says, uh, the latter is, as it were, the search for the cause of a given effect, and to that extent is somewhat hypothetical in character, though as I shall show elsewhere, it is not really so. Kant knows that he needs the subjective deduction in order to cash in the metaphor of synthesis and finally explain what the mind does and how the doing of it makes a manyness into a oneness. But here he talks as though that's perfectly obvious. He just introduces the term synthesis with no explanation. We will get to it, but it's not yet clear what he's talking about. Now, now Kant says, Synthesis in general, as we shall hereafter see, is the mere result of the power of imagination, a blind but indispensable function of the soul, without which we should have no knowledge whatsoever, but of which we are scarcely ever conscious. To bring this synthesis to concepts is a function which belongs to the understanding, and it, and it is through this function of the understanding that we first obtain knowledge properly so called. And now he writes another passage I won't quote because I'm quoting too much, and moves on to the table of categories. Let me first magically swap off this for the next board, which, if it doesn't fall down, which has the table of categories on it. And at this point, you'll notice, first of all, whoops, I've got myself tangled up with it. How's that doing, Alex? Is that okay? You'll notice that this is the same shape, right? Four triads. And each of these categories is keyed to one of those functions of unity and judgment that we just went through. At this point, Kant gives one of the few truly bad arguments in the critique. Well, so much for show and tell. Excuse me. <clears throat> staples assured me this wouldn't happen. But you know you can't count on staples. As I say, at this point, we get to one of the few genuinely bad arguments in the critique. There are a lot of complicated arguments. There are a lot of arguments you want, might want to take uh, issue with. You might, at the end, decide that you don't think that anything that Kant said was true. But there are very few places where he just plain gives a, a flat-out bad argument. And this is, I, this is the only place I know that's a really important bad argument. The argument is this. We have the table of functions of unity in judgment. He doesn't say where he got them from. I'll say something about that in a moment. But we have them. The same function of the mind, the same power of the mind, 
that produces these functions of unity and judgment produces these categories. Therefore, they, there must be one, of, one category for each function of unity and judgment. Let me say, first of all, just, this is just a, uh, an aside, if you wonder where Kant got the table of functions of unity and judgment from, the answer is he made it up, in effect. If you go back and look at the logic textbooks of his day, most of those functions of unity in judgment crop up one place or another in the logic textbooks. But there's no logic textbook that anybody's ever been able to find that has all of them. And Kant just took what was available in the logic of his day and organized it nicely into a table of four triads, added a couple here and there to flesh things out, and then acted as though it had been handed down from on high, like the, ta like the tablets given to Moses on Mount Sinai, and that it was just there. Now, here's why this is such a bad argument. It was quite common in Kant's day to invoke what used to be called faculty psychology. That is, the mind was considered to have a number of faculties, intuition or sensibility, understanding, reason, imagination, judgment, a little bit like what used to be called phrenology. For those of you who are familiar with phrenology, very popular in the late 18th and 19th century, although this has nothing to do with directly with what Kant was doing. But you would see phrenolo phrenology was the theory that from bumps on the head, you could tell where in the head were located different capacities or faculties of the mind. So somebody might have a big bump of imagination and tell whoppers. And another person might have a big bump of logic or reason and be able to do logic very well. And there were elaborate diagrams of this, of the skull, showing which, but now that's not such a stupid idea, it's just that nobody had any evidence for it. Now what you get with magnetic resonance imaging and so forth is actual maps of the brain which can tell you which parts of the brain perform which functions. And doctors and scientists use that all the time, for example, to, to to figure out what goes on when a certain part of the brain is damaged and can't perform that function. But Kant and other people in his day had nothing like that sort of medical information. So the invocation of functions of the mind, when it was properly done, was all backwards. That is to say, you would identify something that the mind can do, and you would label it with the name of a function, uh, a faculty in the mind. If there were two different things that the mind could do, then you would give two different labels. Two things it can do, two faculties. Five things it can do, five faculties. That was okay because the argument was all based on what you could observe the mind doing. Remembering, imagining, uh, in Hume's marvelous descriptions, taking the image of a horse and the image of a man and combining them to make the image of a centaur, for example, who is half man, half horse if you remember your Greek mythology. Things like that. That was okay. What was not okay was to reason in the other direction. Because since you had no access directly to the faculties of the mind, it was not okay to say, this, this faculty does two different things, therefore the mind must do these two different things in the same way. Only if you could independently establish that the ways that the mind was doing it were the same in both cases, could you then infer from that that it was the same faculty that was doing it. But here Kant reverses the argument. He infers the table of categories from the table of functions of unity and judgment by saying, since the same faculty that, does, that produces unity and judgment also unifies representations under categories, therefore the two tables must be parallel. This is a lousy argument. Fortunately, and this is typical of Kant, nothing, depend, nothing serious in the critique depends on it, unless you are the sort of person who obsessively is concerned with showing that absolutely everything in the, in the critique can be defended. The only commentator I know who was like that was H.J. Payton, who was distinguished as being, in my youth, the only commentator in English who had written books on both Kant's ethics and Kant's theory of knowledge. Peyton produced a two-volume work on Kant's critique, 
in which essentially he expounded everything in the critique. He was a little bit like, if I can put it that way, uh, what's the name of the woman who's now Trump's voice in public? Kellyanne Connor? Conway? Kellyanne Conway. She goes on television, and no matter what he says, three different contradictory things in 45 minutes, she's there to say that they all fit together. Well, she's the sort of H.J. Payton of politics. No matter what Kant says, Peyton's there to say it all fits together, even though anybody in his right mind can see that it doesn't all fit together. Peyton and Kemp Smith were the two big commentators when I was young, and Peyton used to drive me nuts. I'll tell you one more story, since I can't stop myself. It's a Kant story. At the age of 20, I got my master's degree and got a fellowship to wander around Europe for a year, and off I went to Oxford to spend a semester. Well, I couldn't live in a college, because I was only there for a semester. But I ran into Ronnie Dworkin, who was a classmate of mine, and Ronnie was there doing a brilliant two-year first in law. And Ronnie said, well, you can be an external student of Magdalen College. Uh, you can't live there, but you can eat there. I said, swell. How does that happen? And he took me off to see the president, as he was called, of Magdalen. Everybody else was a master, but this guy was called a president for some obscure reason. And I went to his, to his room, to his house, with Ronnie, and we had tea. And when I came out at the end, I turned to Ronnie and I said, well, do you think I'll get in? And Ronnie, who was super sophisticated, looked at me rather oddly and said, you have been admitted, couldn't you tell? Right then I knew that Oxford was not the place for me. But anyway, I beetled off to T.D. Weldon, big con expert at, in Magdalen College. Weldon, it turned out, was a perpetual drunk who looked like the caterpillar in uh, Alice in Wonderland. He was seated on a, on a, in a chair on a, on a large plush cushion, obviously three sheets to the wind. And I came in and said, you know, very young and eager, I said, oh, Mr. Weldon, not professor, Mr. Weldon, uh, I'm very excited about studying Kant. I want to take Peyton in one hand and Kemp Smith in the other and go through the critique. He said, oh, my dear boy, you don't want to do that. What you want to do is read Rousseau's Emile. I didn't know. So I rushed out and I got a copy of Rousseau's Emile. I started reading it. I don't know if you've read Rousseau's Emile. The first 50 pages is all about breastfeeding and swaddling of infants. And I thought that Weldon had gone gaga. I pushed my way all the way through a meal, but that was, I understood why he said it. When, when a copy of Rousseau's A Meal showed up in Koenigsberg, Kant was so taken by it that he forgot to take his daily walk with his servant Lampe that day. And since the people of Koenigsberg were known to set their clocks by Kant, he was so regular in his walks, they knew that something had happened. Anyway, I got assigned to a tutor, and I went off to see him. And I just saw him once, but it was clear I just didn't want to study, so I went off and did folk dancing in a kilt that I bought at the Edinburgh Festival. My tutor was some guy I'd never heard of called Peter Strawson. So I sort of missed out on a chance there, I guess. But at any rate, off I went. Well, so much for all of that. Uh, how did I get started on that? The, this is one of the few points that comics have asked. Yes, yes. Nevertheless, it is, important, it is important to pay attention to these categories, especially it's going to turn out that the most important category is not, as you might have thought, unity or plurality or totality or reality or negation or limitation, possibility existence uh, and Necessity must have been on the next page and never made it on here. There's a necessity in there. The important one is, of course, the second category of relation, of causality and dependence. Now, let me just say what's really going on philosophically, although Kant himself seems not quite to understand this. Kant thinks he has established that these are the categories because of that phony argument from the table of functions of unity and judgment. What's really going on is that Kant is giving us 
a brief picture of what he's going to try to prove. And in particular, he is going to derive the categories, most importantly the category of cause and effect, by a straightforward argument that doesn't come up here but comes up in the next 100 or 150 pages and so. So if you think of this as a to be shown rather than a, than a already shown, then you can understand what's happening. Kant talks as though just that, that lousy faculty psychology argument there at uh, A7879 is enough to establish the legitimacy of the categories. But that isn't true at all. He's going to actually have to produce arguments for them. And when he does that in the section called the analogies of experience, it will turn out that he has a very good argument for the second category of relation, causality and dependence. A so-so argument for the other two. And nothing really in the way of a knockdown argument for any of the others. Now, from my point of view, that's okay. If Kant can really, from the premise that he's going to take, which is a minimal premise, derive the validity of the causal maxim, that's pretty big news. That's world historical news. The fact that he doesn't also have a knockdown argument for all 11 other categories strikes me as minor business indeed. At any rate, now, at this point, I want to take just a moment to go back to this notion of unity and explain what the problem is that Kant is trying to solve. And it's a problem that can be made clear, interestingly enough, by a passage in the Treatise of Human Nature, which Kant was unaware of, because he hadn't read the treatise and it wasn't a part of the treatise that made it into Beatty's essay on the nature and immutability of the truth. But Kant recognized the problem independently of Hume, not surprisingly, and realized that he needed a really big argument to handle it. Let, the problem is this problem of the unity of a manifold, the oneness of a manyness. And here is what Hume has to say. I have to alert you to one problem which you can just adjust to. Hume and Kant use somewhat different terms. Hume, Kant uses the term identity where, he, where Hume uses the term identity where Kant uses the term unity. Here's what Hume has to say. One single object conveys the idea of unity, not that of identity. One single object gives us the concept of one thing. On the other hand, a multiplicity of objects, a manifold in Kant's term, a multiplicity of objects can never convey this idea of identity, however resembling they may be supposed. The mind always pronounces the one not to be the other and considers them as forming two, three, or any determinate number of objects whose existence are entirely distinct and independent. Since then, both number and unity are incompatible with the relation of identity. It must lie in something that is neither of them. But to tell the truth, at first sight, this seems utterly impossible. Betwixt unity and number, there can be no medium, no more than betwixt existence and non-existence. After one object is supposed to exist, we must either suppose another also to exist, in which case we have the idea of number, or we must suppose it not to exist, in which case that the first object remains at unity. Hume then goes on to give a brilliant psychological explanation of how we are led to believe something that is manifestly false, namely the continued and independent existence of objects. What leads us to suppose that this hand, which I now look away and don't see anymore and then look back to, a new perception, is the same hand even though manifestly it's a different perception. And Hume goes on to say, what leads us to suppose that the ash in the fireplace is the residue of that same log that was there before when it doesn't even very much resemble the log that was there before? And he then gives us a whole elaborate psychological explanation, which however is not a philosophical justification of the assertion of what he calls identity and what Kant is calling unity. That is the problem that Kant faces. Synthesis is supposed to take a manyness and out of it produce a unity. 
but it is not at all clear how that's even conceivable. And at this point, it's utterly unclear how the mind does that. And the notion that it grasps what is manifold in, the, in one thought, although it's a very nice metaphor, is no answer to the question. So although Kant hadn't read this passage from Hume, he might just as well have, because it's the same problem. Slightly different language, but exactly the same problem. And that is exactly the problem that Kant is going to tackle right away in the very next section, which you remember is, is, we are referring to as the subjective deduction. Now, I am not going to take that, try to, try to slide into that in this lecture. That needs a whole new lecture to tackle. And it is, take me as long as I have to, it's the most important thing, I think, in the long, complicated argument leading to the validity of the causal maxim. But before I end this lecture, there is one other thing I would like to say. Those of us who study the great works of philosophy, especially the works that deal with logic or theory of knowledge, tend to view them as the medievals would have said, subspecie eternitatis, under the aspect of eternity. That is to say, we take them as timeless examinations of fundamental philosophical problems. Very few of us would think in lecturing on the critique to point out that the first edition of the critique, the first, the, 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 that the critique was published in the year in which the colonies in North America got together and signed the Articles of Confederation, 1781. Or that the second edition of the critique, this very important revision, was published in the year that the convention in Philadelphia wrote the, the Constitution and approved it, which became the Constitution of the United States of America. We used to have a joke when I was, philosophers have jokes, but they're not terribly funny. But anyway, we used to have a joke when I was uh, in, college or in graduate school, how can you remember that Hume died in 1776? Answer, it's the same year that Adam Smith published The Wealth of Nations. It's not much of a joke, but you get the point. At any rate, here I am lecturing on the critique, which is my all-time favorite great work of philosophy, at a time when the United States is locked in what is surely the most consequential presidential campaign since 1860. And what the polls indicate is that roughly half of the adult citizens in this country who can be bothered to vote are prepared to elect as president a man who is an ignorant, narcissistic buffoon who is hell-bent on bringing fascism to the United States. Now that's got nothing to do with the critique of pure reason. And if you're watching this in the year 2042, you may be quite puzzled why I'm even mentioning it. But I have lost so much sleep over this matter that I have taken to not watching television anymore because it is driving me insane. I do what I can. I give money. I will vote when I get a chance. I volunteer every week for the Clinton campaign here in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, registering people to vote until I was kicked out of Harris Teeter because they said that was soliciting. I was rather bummed out by that because the Cub Scouts had a stand set up in front of the store where they were selling cookies. And it seemed to me that if Cub Scouts could sell cookies, then we ought to be permitted to register people to vote. But you can't argue with management. I hope that those of you who are watching this before the election will get out and vote. For God's sake, vote for Clinton. She was not my first choice, I admit it. I gave so much money to Bernie Sanders that he started sending money back. Uh, literally true. I apparently exceeded the legal limit, so I got a check for $300 from the, from the Sanders campaign telling me, we're very sorry, but we can't accept this. But I will vote for Clinton. Somebody asked me what I thought about Hillary Clinton, and I said, quite honestly, I thought she was the most intelligent, the most knowledgeable, the best prepared, and the most experienced Republican to vote to run for president in my lifetime. Unfortunately, she's running on the Democratic ticket. But between a Republican running on the Democratic, well, she is. I mean, she is what in my youth would have been called a Rockefeller Republican or an Eisenhower Republican. <laughs> 
that is in tight with Wall Street and an internationalist in foreign affairs. But as between a moderate Republican and a fascist, it seems to me the choice is simple. So I will break all protocol, even though I'm in a university setting in which I think I'm not supposed to say such things for obscure reasons. I trust that the governor doesn't watch YouTube videos on Immanuel Kant's critique of pure reason, and he has more, more urgent things concerning him. Next week, I urge you, if you've been coasting along, figuring, well, Wolf talks a pretty good game, I won't bother to read the text, read the next assignment. The next assignment, for those of you who may be wondering, is, I think I have it written here someplace, It is technically from A78, no, sorry, it's not that. It is the transcendental deduction up to it's the deduction in A, put it that way. It's the deduction in A. It is A95 through A130. Now that is only 21 pages, but it is 21 very difficult and important pages. And I will, I will go into it in very great detail. That's when, we, yes? Professor Wolf, before you conclude, I did have one question about reading we did for today. Sure. Um, sometimes there's a phrase that Kant uses, which in the Kemp Smith translation gets translated as objective validity. Objective validity, yeah. And there's another phrase that he uses, in the Kemp, which in the Kemp Smith translation gets translated as objective reality. And since I don't know German, I don't know if these two translations correspond to the same phrase in German. Or, and this is Kemp Smith's whimsical mapping of the same phrase onto two different English phrases, or if these are actually two different phrases in the German and Kant had something different in mind by objective validity and objective reality. Um, and I was just wondering if you had any The question I've been asked, even though this little mic picks up everybody's voice very nicely, I've been asked to repeat the question. And the question essentially is, what if anything in the Kemp Smith translation is the difference between objective validity and objective yeah. reality. Uh, let me give you a really technical answer, which may be hard to understand, but I, I think it's important. The answer is I haven't a clue. <laughs> <laughs> I would have to go and look at the text and try to figure out. Uh, I'll, I'll take a look at it and see if I can come in next week. But at the moment, I draw a total blank. I haven't a clue. What I would guess is, since I haven't a clue, it's probably going to turn out not to be important to me, since I tend to remember the things that were important to me. It's probably vitally important to other Kant scholars, but not to me. Otherwise, I would remember. But at the moment, not a clue. Okay. Alex, I, I will see all of you next week. <laughs>